I appreciate the invitation to speak today to talk about an area that I think is, is really going to be particularly important for the future of our industry. Um, and I'll talk about one specific, uh, I'll talk about the context of the problem and one specific manifestation that I've become uh, involved in trying to bring to fruition, and that is cell-penetrating mini proteins. So the, the, the broad problem <clears throat> is that we're actually extraordinarily limited in the uh, actionability to act on all of the information about new targets. You've heard this discussed by Jeff and Aaron uh, in the last talk about saying it's one thing to identify targets, it's another thing to figure out what they do, whether you should agonize or antagonize them, and then it's another thing to ask whether it's actually druggable after you've gone through all that. So I'm going to talk about the druggability part of the equation today and, and uh, how good or bad are we at it and uh, what w might we do about the state of play as it stands right now. Um, so there are, to take um, a 30, maybe a 50,000 foot view of the universe, there are really only two classes of well-proven drugs. And uh, those are biologics, as illustrated here by this monoclonal antibody, <clears throat> Herceptin. And uh, these things have very large contact surface areas, uh, upward, anywhere from 1,000 to 3,000 square angstroms in contact surface area. And so they're pretty much free from the tyranny of chemistry at the interface of one protein with another. They can contact, uh, they have great stickiness uh, by virtue of large contact surface areas. However, um, by virtue of their size and polarity, they don't cross cell membranes. So their operating theater is limited to that of extracellular targets. Small molecules have the opposite problem. They don't have the geographic problem uh, that antibodies have or other protein therapeutics have. So small molecules can almost always be synthetically manipulated to make them cross biological barriers to get uh, into the brain, to get into uh, other tissues, to get inside of the cell. Um, but they're small. And by virtue of being small, they have limited adhesive power. L adhesive power is, a, is a, roughly speaking, a function of contact surface area. So they have contact surface areas of a few hundred square angstroms, and that means that they rely uh, largely for driving the energetics of binding on hydrophobic interactions, and uh, by virtue of small contact surface areas, they require engulfment by the things that they target in order to maximize utilization of contact surface area. That is, they only bind to targets that have hydrophobic pockets. They don't bind flat targets or uh, shallow um, targets. So these things have completely different profiles, but um, each of them has a severe limitation on its operating theater. So what do those look like numerically? Well, biologics are limited to that subset of human proteins that are either secreted or embedded in the cell membrane. We don't know exactly what that number is, but it's on the order of 10%. No one disagrees with that very much. 10% of all human proteins. So uh, if you're good at discovering biologics, this is your part of the world. It's the 10% of human proteins that are secreted or embedded in the membrane. Um, for, with respect to small molecules, again, we don't know exactly what fraction of human proteins are targetable by small molecules that have a hydrophobic pocket, either which is evident in a crystal structure and, or is inducible. And there's a fair bit of chirping in the Twitterverse about whether it's 10% or 12% or whatever. To me, those are all rounding errors. The, the, the fact is that the vast majority of um, human proteins are not targetable by small molecules in any way that's obvious uh, at this stage or that we've happened upon by heuristic um, work. Now, um, so if we put together 10% and 10%, that means right, given what the tools that we have available to us right now, we, we can cover about 20% of all human proteins. Um, but that's a vast overestimate. It's an overestimate by at least 5% or perhaps more, because many of the major targets of these things are actually targets for those things also. So you don't get to count them twice. And so these are any extracellular protein that's targetable by a small molecule. Think of the major classes of small molecule drugs and the things that they target. GPCRs and ion channels fall into both of these bins. 
So the actual druggable universe by the modalities that we have right now is considerably less than 20%. And again, we don't know the exact number, but the bottom line is that no matter how good you are at discovery biology, in order to act on that discovery biology, you slam right into the druggability problem. Um, and so as we make progress in biology, and I'm going to talk about more, more about this, that we also really need to pick up the pace at which we make progress on the druggability problem as well. Um, I've, for the past oh, a little bit more than 15 years at Harvard um, and, and external to Harvard as well, uh, I've been working on attempting to discover new modalities that will attempt in various ways to fill the gap between these two. And um, sometimes there's a tendency of, of people to say, well, you, you know, if you come on board with this new modality, you might only be able to cover another 5% of targets. And my, my answer to that is, well, that's exactly what is a reasonable expectation. If you bring a new modality on board and all small molecules, which are more than 150 years of history in this science, if they can only cover 10% of the universe, why in the world would we expect a new modality to cover more than that right out the starting gate? We have to have reasonable expectation. That's all of biologics, 10% of the universe. And yet this has made an enormous impact on human health. So we shouldn't set unrealistic expectations of ourselves. We should say if we're going to bring on board a new modality, if it can cover a few percent in, in, uh, of targets that are really medically relevant and we know how to aim those new uh, modalities, then we're doing well and we'll make a huge impact. Um, another way to look at this is with my commercial hat on and to say, um, here we are, you know, 10% is the entire uh, pharma industry and that has an annual uh, output of $750 billion and in the other, another 10% is the entire biotech industry uh, and that has an annual output of $250 billion. So we're talking, uh, the stakes are very large for patients and um, the, the economic incentives are aligned uh, in this sense. Now let's talk about the risk equation. I haven't talked about the risk equation of new modalities. I want to think about this first in an economic way and then talk about it scientifically, if you'll forgive me for doing that. But um, what you've just heard is a brilliant exposition on the following phenomenon that in advancements in biology as a result of GWAS studies, tumor sequencing, DNA sequencing writ large, but also uh, deep phenotyping, uh, lots of progress across the science of biology has created an exponential increase in our understanding of biology over our lifetimes. Just think about the number of areas of new bio. When I was a postdoc at MIT, uh, 30 years ago, just across the river from here, um, the biology of RNA was considered to be utterly boring. Um, in, in fact, my very close friend, Stuart Schreiber, when I told him I was going to work on RNA as a junior professor, he said, hey, be careful of your career. Um, and Stuart's brilliant. Um, so uh, again, just think about that area. Think about genome editing. Think about... Um, the unfolded protein response. They, you, there's not an area, think about the microbiome. There's not an area of biology that you can't point to that has made really explosive growth, growth in this time frame. Uh, and that's going to continue to happen. And um, as you've seen, the tools to figure out biology are getting better and better and better. So um, that has led to our understanding increasingly what are the right targets. Um, so target risk is decreasing at, uh, relative to um, way back here. Now, what about the actionability of this biology? Well, that's targeting science. So I, I don't care whether targeting science is a virus or a small molecule or a nu nucleic acid or a whatever. It's the interventional thing that you do to modulate a disease. So let's just call it science, uh, targeting science, so that we we don't get caught up in internecine battles between chemists and biologists. But if you think about the early stage of the um, of the targeting science, it was small molecules, and we 
that leveled off pretty early on. Things like fragment screening and combinatorial chemistry and so on haven't dramatically expanded what we can target with small molecules. They're about the same now as they were way back when. And then along came monoclonal antibodies, let's say, and along comes siRNAs or whatever you will. But the, the pace of progress in targeting science is nowhere near, it's linear. It's not exponential. Uh, and that creates a gap between the understanding of biology and the ability to act on it. Now, if you go back about 15 years ago, and I'm sorry for all this philosophy, but I'm just trying to explain what got me here, why I'm, wh why I'm so obsessed with this area. If you look back 15 years ago, and you're an academic entrepreneur, and you say, well, I really want to make a big, this is a big problem, we know it's a big problem, that was clear 15 years ago, let's go do something about it. Let's go bring on board a new modality. Let's go invent a new modality, whatever that is. And at that time, the gap between the understanding of biology, you can think of this as like, that's demand and that's supply with respect to generation of new drugs. So, and you think about this gap between supply and demand creates force. So 15 years ago, a lot of these targets were still pretty risky. Um, so to stack a risky biology on top of risky chemistry isn't really a good thesis for, um, you know, going, it's great for academics, um, but academics, of course, had access to, uh, problems with access to capital. Um, but now if you look out here, this gap has gotten wider and wider and wider, and it's creating more and more and more force. So you think, you see things in the, if I can call it the medical marketplace, you, things, you see things like gene therapy coming back in a very significant way. You see, a, you see a, co a private company like Moderna raising more than a billion dollars privately to, to take on gain-of-function therapeutics using nucleic acids. That's filling the gap. Gene therapy is filling the gap. New, uh, other uh, antisense oligonucleotides, like my company, Wave Life Sciences, is filling the gap. These are making possible actionable targets that were not, action or not actionable by small molecules uh, or, or antibodies. So what I would submit to you is that our future, um, of course, antibodies and small molecules are not going to go away. But over the next decade, there will be an explosion of new modalities, and these things will be able will make significant contributions to medicine. And this is here and now because the demand has risen to the point where there's um, access of companies. Um, in this space and, and uh, to a lesser extent academic groups to really go in and do something uh, in these areas. So what we define, chemists like to talk about what is a drug-like structure. I've never liked the term particularly because it ignores um, antibodies. Uh, but I think uh, if we just say right now we have certain small molecules and antibodies and those are drug-like structures, our um, definition of a drug-like structure will be completely blown to smithereens in the next 10 years. And we will see many, many different types of modalities come on board uh, as drugs. So the other thing that's worth mentioning is just a, a, a shout out to the academic community that if you met every one of those new modalities that I mentioned, CRISPRs, siRNAs, viruses, antisense oligonucleotides, and on and on and on, all of them get into cells by endocytic vesicle trafficking, and all of them have intracellular targets. Of course, we're focusing on intracellular targets because for extracellular targets, they're fairly good tools to get at them medically, but for intracellular targets, that's where the real deficiency is. So, as I said, all of these new modalities are molecules that do not uh, pass cell membranes uh, passively. They need active transport into cells by endocytic vesicle trafficking and also escape from endocytic vesicles. Our future lies in understanding and exploitation of endocytic vesicle trafficking. What do we know about it? It's one of the most underdeveloped areas of biology relative to how important it is. Um, for the future of medicine. 
So we need to really begin. If you ask um, anyone from most companies that are including Moderna, including uh, Wave, including El Nylum, including on and on and on, exactly, do you know exactly how your drugs get into cells and how they get out of endosomes? And 201, the answer is no, we don't know that yet. So that can't be the state of affairs going forward. Um, so it's going to be important to develop cl new classes of molecules that get around some of the deficiencies of existing classes of molecules, and then to develop an entirely new pharmacology. Um, if you're working with molecules that are trafficked endocytically, using the blood as a surrogate for what's going on in the, in the tissue, or if you're trying to, to, to direct a CRISPR to the beta cells in the pancreas, et cetera, using, you cannot use the blood as a surrogate anymore for where that drug is going. So we will have also, in, along with this, have to reinvent, uh, develop much better ways of figuring out where drugs are going uh, and what their fate is and what's happening to them um, that don't rely purely on sampling of blood. So these self-penetrating mini-proteins are just one class um, that we think will have uh, a role in this area, and these combine the cell permeability of small molecules and also the synthetic accessibility, their synthetic molecules, with the broad targeting power of biologics. So they're kind of a, a mashup of biologics and small molecules. The original idea here um, was that if you, let's imagine that you have a target and you have a ligand, a biological ligand, so this is a protein that modulates disease, this is its intracellular interactor, that they've already figured out how to recognize each other. So why throw that away? Why throw that information away? We know that this, if you tried to apply it externally to a cell, that it couldn't get through the cell membrane. It runs into the biologics problem of lack of cell penetration. So you might think, well, maybe the problem is it's too big and it's too polar, so let's strip it down. Let's minimize it and take it down to its bare essentials, just the region of this protein, the business end, that comes into contact with the, the target. And um, this is sort of like saying that the Tobin Bridge, you know, the, or the Golden Gate Bridge, that the business end of it is the deck. And so why not, why do you have all that other stuff on the bridge? You know, it's just there. It's, it's, it's a hassle, right? But the rest of the stuff on the bridge is conferring on the deck its active structure, which is required to function. And it's exactly the same thing with proteins. The rest of that protein is a supporting structure that confers upon the business end its bioactive conformation. So what happens when you strip it out, extract it from the protein synthetically, is that it unfolds. So no surprise here. Hmm, okay, that's supposed to unfold, but use your imagination, it unfolds. Um, and so along with, un oh there, hang on a second, I, I, I'll try this again. Oh, okay, all right, there you go. Um, so it unfolds, it's just a molecular dynamics simulation of a peptide. Um, so along with unfolding, several very nasty things happen. Whereas that in the, in the framework of the protein, this thing was folded up into a compact structure that was prevented from proteolytic degradation. Now it's exposed, now, and, and also which is entropically um, locked into its bioactive conformation. Now it has a low binding affinity because you have to pay the entropic price of putting it into the bioactive conformation. It's degraded because its amid bonds are uh, exposed to, to proteolytic, to proteases. Um, and also the amid bonds are exposed to water and exposed to the hydrophobic interior of the membrane. So they tend to have poor cell permeability. So this problem um, uh, has really vexed the entire field of peptide therapeutics. And um, we, we thought, going way back, my postdoc, Chris Schaffmeister, and myself, that maybe there's a, a simplifying assumption going on here that all three of these come from unfolding. And if we could just restore the fold of this peptide, maybe we could stabilize it, and maybe it would go through a membrane uh, if we did that. So the system that Chris came up with 
is shown here. These are two amino acid building blocks which are incorporated into a peptide. Um, and they, they have two, uh, diff two different al alpha helix stabilizing strategies which had not been combined previously. So work by Isabella Carl showed that when you al geminally dimethylate the alpha carbon of a peptide that that um, enhances helix stability by a local conformational effect like you learned about in elementary organic chemistry. And then if you tie together across one turn of the macrocycle, you create a macrocyclic ring constraint. And we decided to do this by olefin metathesis um, because it was the, the one chemical reaction which we knew could be done on peptides, so Bob Grubbs had shown that, and it was the most atom economical reaction. It required the fewest, it installed the fewest number of atoms, and they were all carbon. So we wanted this, this unit to be all carbon atoms so that we would not introduce heteroatoms that were likely to impede cell penetration. Um, so this is the original all hydrocarbon um, so-called alpha helix stapling system. And um, since we first reported this, there's sprung up an entire um, field um, around the creation of different types of staple peptides and, and um, looking at the various merits of, uh, of those in different settings. Um, to my knowledge, this is... Um, until very recently, was the one that really gives the highest levels of helix stability, um, the, the largest PK extension. These things are cleared by biliary clearance, <clears throat> not by renal clearance. Most peptides, as many of you know, are cleared by renal filtration very rapidly and cleared by proteolytic degradation. These can have long serum half-lives, up to 48 hours in rats, and they're just different um, from typical peptides. And what Lauren Walensky in my lab showed a number of years ago, really first in 2004, Lauren is on the faculty now at Harvard Medical School, um, that when um, an unstable peptide is treated with cells, no surprise, um, it doesn't get in very effectively. There's a very, very small amount of uptake. But when you take the same peptide, as illustrated here, and staple it, it not only gets into cells, but it escapes endosomes, and it ends up on its target inside of the cell. And in this case, the target is BCL2 family members on the mitochondrial membrane. So these uh, endosomal, endosomal uptake is not good enough. You have, the, the molecule has to escape endosomes to be bioactive inside of the cell. So these things are getting in, they're getting out of endosomes, and they're getting on their targets. And we know from a variety of su uh, studies subsequently that these things also freely cross the nuclear membrane. So once they're inside of the cytoplasm, they're inside of the nucleus. They're way below the exclusion size of the nuclear pore complex, and they have been used in multiple settings now to target transcription factors. Um, this very first uh, uh, set of peptides that we developed, this is Lauren and myself in collaboration with Andrew Kung and Stan Korsmeyer at the Dana-Farber, um, we, we, we dosed these with a, a mice that had been xenotransplanted with a, a, a treatment refractory human T-cell leukemia um, that had a luminescent marker um, embedded in it so that we could track the tumor burden. So these are animals that were treated only with the ve treatment vehicle for the peptide, not with the peptide itself. And this false color image just shows the tumor burden increasing. And when a staple peptide at 10 milligrams per kilogram per day was administered by tail, tail vein injection into these animals, you could see that there was a very clear diminution of the tumor burden without any other um, obvious negative effect on these animals. And then a control peptide, which had a single point mutation, did not have uh, such a pronounced therapeutic effect. This had a tenfold decreased affinity for several BCL2 family members. So that, this really ignited um, an effort to uh, go off and use these things for, in a therapeutic setting. And again, with any new modality, there's a lot to learn on the way to bringing this to patients. And this challenge was taken up by Aileron Therapeutics. 
And so this is the original report of the first showing active endosomal uptake of a staple peptide. So these things do not cross cell membranes passively. Every one that's been studied thus far um, is taken up by endocytic vesicle trafficking and um, uh, many of these molecules, although by no means all, um, show good cell penetration and show good endosomal escape. And that's something which can be um, enhanced systematically by structure activity relation studies. Um, uh, Fed Bernal in my lab uh, set out to discover a stapled peptide, in this case one that has connection of the staple at the I and I plus 7 positions. Earlier I was showing you peptides that had the staple bridging one turn, that's I and I plus 4. So this one, the staple bridges two turns. Here you can see here, there's an intervening turn and it sets back down at the end, two turns later. Um, so Fed discovered a staple peptide that targets HDM2, a negative regulator of P53, which is frequently amplified um, in, in tumors that lack P53 responsiveness. Um, and it's also been subsequently shown by our lab and Lauren's lab, David Blaine's lab as well, that these things not only target HDM2, but importantly, they target a second negative regulator of P53, which is known as HDMX or 4. Uh, Aileron Therapeutics took this uh, Harvard molecule and uh, work by Tommy Sawyer and his group at Aileron led to further optimization and to the entry of um, the, a closely related molecule into the clinic um, now, which is being used for a wide variety, uh, at least is in clinical testing in phase 1, 2A studies for a, a variety of um, cancer indications. And we expect those trials to begin reading out this year. So we're very, very excited to now have the first staple peptide that targets an intracellular uh, target in cancer now in human patients, and um, we'll keep our, keep our fingers crossed. So at Harvard, we've continued to develop both the targets that are targetable by this technology to try to learn what the limits of it are uh, and what are the best, what's the, what are the best applications, uh, and also to develop the chemistry further and to try to optimize the chemistry. And uh, so I'll tell you a little bit about those two fronts. So this, what, what's shown here is a transcription factor that uh, is known as NOTCH. It has three subunits. One subunit here, CSL, that contacts DNA. This is Steve Blacklow's crystal structure. And another one which translocates from the membrane to the nucleus upon gamma secretase activation, so that's ICN. And when these two come together, they create a binding site for the transcriptional coactivator mammal. So mammal then, this is the, the core recognition domain of mammal. This um, dot loads onto this bipartite complex and initiates the activation of transcription. And uh, NOTCH is, of course, an important developed regulator in many uh, settings in humans. Um, but in the context of, of cancer, it is very, very frequently, certainly greater than 90% of all T-cell acute lymphoblastic leukemias have some aberrant activation of the NOTCH pathway. So we uh, began working together with Jay Bradner, who now uh, heads R&D at Novartis. We, we did this at a collaboration before, before Jay joined, joined Novartis. We, uh, we teamed up with my graduate student, um, Ray Mollering, uh, who's now on the faculty at the University of Chicago. And we discovered a stapled peptide called SOM1 that powerfully blocks the trans incels, the transactivation ability of the notch complex. And so now we're going after a direct transcription factor with no obvious binding site for a small molecule, never been shown to be targeted by small molecules. And yet this SOM1 and related molecules targeted incels um, at least the, the binding affinity for these molecules is in the low double-digit nanomolar range, so 20 nanomolar, 15 nanomolar on that order. And um, in studies that, were, that have been published, we showed that this notch um, targeting ligand 
um, in, in spontaneous models of TALL in mice now targeting mouse notch in the, in the mouse. These were generated by Gary Gilliland before he uh, left to head the oncology group at Merck and now uh, Gary is the head of the University of Pennsylvania Cancer Center. At the time, he and his, his co-workers developed a spontaneous model of TALL and we did two different dosing regimens. I know you can't see this, I'm sorry. It's 35 milligrams per kilogram, um, single dose per day. And this is 30 milligrams per kilogram twice per day. And you can see with the higher dosing level um, that uh, this is clearly exerting a, a beneficial effect, is knocking down the, the, the growth of this, um, the proliferation of the TALL. And when we did expression profiling on the blood of these animals, and did an unsupervised um, gene set enrichment analysis, we found the number one correlation of the changes in the blood of these animals was with a gamma secretase inhibitor, which was directly targeting the notch pathway. So this is not only knocking down the cancer, it's knocking it down by, an, a, method, by a um, mechanism that's clearly dependent on direct antagonism of an oncogenic transcription factor that's currently considered to be undruggable. We've, um, so this is the reference for those of you um, who are interested in, in this area. Um, in another study, so we decided to really focus intense concentration on undruggable transcription factors. And another one which came to our attention is beta-catenin, which is inappropriately activated in, again, something like 90% of metastatic colorectal cancers, but it's also important in breast and pancreatic cancer, prostate cancer. It's a, 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 a relative, it's, a, it's an important um, it's an embryonic driver of proliferation that is inappropriately activated in many cancers. And what you can see here, this is the armadillo domain of beta-catenin, that it has this shallow groove. It doesn't have any hydrophobic pocket that would be targetable by a small molecule. Uh, and yet, um, with stapled peptides, this is an x-ray crystal structure done in our lab by Brian Bowman of a peptide discovered by Tom Grossman and Johannes Yeh of a stapled peptide that, again, with low single-digit nanomolar affinity, um, targets the uh, binding site for the transcription factor TCF4 on the surface of beta-catenin. So this really gives some optimism, although it's early days and there are certainly going to be transcription factors that won't be targetable by this kind of modality, but it gives us some reason to believe that we might be able to go after a subset of those transcription factors and other proteins that have been undruggable. Um, I wanted to point out that Lauren Walensky, my former coworker, discovered a stapled peptide that targets a different site on beta-catenin, the, 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 bind, the binding site for e -catherin. So this now shows that you can not only drug beta-catenin at one bioactive site but you're using stapled peptides, but you can actually drug it at another bioactive site and use this to interrogate the biology of beta-catenin and ask which site, if either, is the most productive for eventually for taking molecules um, into the clinic for the treatment of metastatic colorectal cancer and other other cancers. Let me just mention in the in the last couple minutes that uh, at Harvard we have continued to develop the chemistry. I won't say too much about this, but just to say that we now have a second generation system which incorporates a lipophilic amine and various types of configurations. Uh, into the molecule, and this really helps to increase the solubility of these peptides without compromising any of, any of the properties of the first generation molecule. So on occasion, because there was all hydrocarbon in the first generation Harvard system, sometimes we had trouble getting a sufficient aqueous solubility of these things, and if they're going to be injectable drugs, we need to have good aqueous solubility. So these have uh, often have better physical properties. They have roughly equivalent helix stabilization, roughly equivalent binding to targets, in this case HDM2, first generation, second generation system, roughly equivalent cell penetration, maybe a little bit, maybe a little bit better, but I wouldn't necessarily count on it. So this is the first generation peptide 
um, and just looking at the intensity here is related to cell penetration, and then second, two different versions of second generation, maybe you have uh, enhanced cell penetration. Um, so we are, we, we've now licensed this out from Harvard, Harvard University to Fog Pharma, and Fog Pharma is taking forward this second generation of molecule. Now one question arises, every example that I've shown you thus far is a little bit of sleight of hand. We started with a peptide that was already known, which came from nature, and we trimmed it down, and we stapled it, and minimized it, and so on. So what happens if you have a target that doesn't have a helical interactor? What do you do in that case? You need to find a helical interactor in order to staple it and move on with cell-based studies. So this is just one example of KRAS and its effector, downstream effector RAF. And you can see that these interact with each other by sheet complementation. And there is no alpha helix that makes any contribution to the interface between these two. And in fact, all known downstream effectors of RAS have exactly the same binding motif. So there's n nothing, no helix that we can sort of rip off as a dominant negative as the basis of discovery of a staple peptide. So what John McGee in our lab did was to say, okay, let's start with a well-known helical scaffold that we can apply direct, to which we can apply directed evolution and go out and screen through diversity space for a scaffolded alpha helix, as shown here, that we can discover, and then hope that it's the helical part that interacts with the target. Um, and then what we could do in a second step then is to strip away the scaffold and replace it with a staple. So it would be a multi-step operation to first use directed evolution to discover a helix and then retrofit for, uh, for stapling. And we used Dane Wittrip's yeast cell surface display system and we're, got a lot of advice from Dane um, on how to do this. And this is just showing the screen. So this is um, actually Alana Shepards is the person who first um, brought, brought forward the notion of using APP. So a, a shout out to her for um, first pioneering this system. And uh, we used it to target RAS. And what you can see, these are just successive, the first round of directed evolution, the second round, oh, this is now on the surface of yeast, so we're using cell sorting to, to um, select yeast and to enrich populations. And um, as we went forward, you can see the affinity for RAS is getting higher, and then when you put RAF in, you can completely knock down the binding of these library members um, to RAS. These um, bind now the highest affinity that we have. We started out with originally with affinities of 20 nanomolar, and we're down now to about 50 picomolar for molecules that are, that are binding um, RAS. These are pan-RAS antagonists. They target all three known RAS isoforms, and they don't effectively target the nearest neighbors in the small G protein space. They'll pull down RAS from cell extracts, as shown here, um, and they're competable by RAF, no surprise. And then if you pull down uh, RAF, you can see that uh, if you use RAS, RAF to pull down, you see that that brings down RAS. And then when you put in the staple peptide, it abrogates the interaction. So these are in cell-based, or in a cell um, extracts. So the crazy thing about this peptide was that when we did an alanine scanning mutagenesis, we found that there was no position that we couldn't, that we modified that didn't have some impact. And that's not usual for ALA scans because some residues are important and other residues are not. Here, every residue was important. That was weird. Um, and we went further then to N15 label the peptide here. And so it has the expected number of signals in an HSQC NMR spectrum. It has about 29 uh, amide bonds, so you can, you can see these. And then when we put in RAS, unlabeled RAS, it doubled the number of signals. So that also was very strange. This thing is not behaving as a one-to-one -one binder to RAS. It's behaving as a two-to-one binder to RAS. And in fact, when Matt Lee and Soyeon Shim solve the crystal structure of this bound. It's binding right on the effector domain of RAS. You can see here it is. There's one protomer, and it's in fact 
a homodimer with a second protomer right here. These are disulfide cross-linked. One protomer makes almost all of the contacts to RAS, and the other protomer is a scaffold for the primary helix. Um, these things unravel the switch one domain of RAS, so they significantly re remodel the surface of RAS, as you can see illustrated here. So this is this uh, uh, confirmation of RAS with an effector bound. The effector is not shown, and this is the confirmation with this um, uh, mini protein bound to it. So what we're doing now, um, we've, we've been working on equipping this for activity in cells to get good endosomal escape and also trying to shave it down to a single helix, and that's work that's ongoing, but it shows that you can get things that have a helical framework that can target all RAS isoforms. And I think this is important for the field um, because there, there, there are a lot of RAS isoforms and there are, K, there are in a lot of RAS mutations in their K, H, and N RAS. And I think it's going to be extraordinarily difficult to develop mutation selective inhibitors for many of those. So the only game in town is then going to be a PAN-RAS antagonist, and we learn how to control its activity the same way we learn to control the activity of most cancer drugs, and that is by dosing. Um, so I just want to mention one more thing, is we've also been working with Pfizer on trying to dial oral bioavailability into these molecules. That may seem crazy to take a long alpha helical peptide of eight or 10 or 12 residues and try to make it orally bioavailable. Um, but we know from cyclosporin, which is shown here, that there is a way to make 11 amino acid peptides orally bioavailable. Nature kind of taught us how to do that. And what nature does is it N-methylates seven of the 11 amide bonds. So these orange balls are N-methyl groups. And then the one, all the ones that are not N-methylated in the membrane transiting form here are hydrogen bonded. So this is all, a, a passive cell penetration is all about NH management of the amide bonds. They either need to be N-methylated or they need to be internally hydrogen bonded. So what we recognize is that when you take a peptide and it forms an alpha helix, that it's managing all of the amide bonds by hydrogen bonding after the first turn. We just need to deal with the first turn of the peptide then. And the way we did this, so there are four NHs that need to be dealt with. So we incorporated proline at this terminal position. By, by the very nature of proline, this takes out one amide NH. When we isolate it, it backbites to form a hydrogen bond that takes out now a second amide. And then um, we incorporate a II plus three staple. This is a new, this system is called the Prolox system. This helps to reinforce helical structure over the rest of the peptide. And then if we incorporate a DEPSI linkage, an ester versus an amide, we can take out three of the four NH bonds. And by the time we do this, we get high levels of passive cell penetration for a significant subset of these peptides. And we've worked for the last two and a half years with uh, Spiros Liras's group um, at Pfizer, and um, they have really exciting um, data showing that these things can actually show significant levels of oral bioavailability in rats. So I wouldn't claim that this is going to be easy going forward, um, but I think there's reason to believe that it may be possible even to dial oral bioavailability into these molecules. Um, I'm not, I won't belabor, I'm running short on time, but I won't belabor this, but it is important to mention that with any new modality that the challenges are at least as great as the opportunity. So um, with, you know, when Remicade first failed for sepsis, there were people who were actually, you know, happy to see that happen. It's unimaginable, but there were people who, you know, felt good about it. That I, I told you that monoclonal antibodies can't, Humanized monoclonal antibodies will never make it as drugs. But um, given perseverance, these things can make it as drugs. Um, we need to learn how to do optimization. Um, there, there are a lot of complex things with cell uptake, endosomal escape, target engagement, stability, PK, the blood's not a good surrogate for what's going on in the rest of the body, and so on. Endocytosis is, a, you know, we really have to learn 
what's going on here. So we're collaboration, collaborating with Marino Zariel's lab at the Max Planck in Dresden to understand endocytic uh, release, which is really poorly understood. And one of the things that really drives me crazy is that with the stapling system du jour, people are not making rigorous crosswise comparisons to see which ones give the best uh, a cell uptake and stability and so on and so on. So the field has to mature uh, a bit. And then finally, I mentioned that we've been able to discover peptides that have oral bioavailability, but um, we, have, we have to learn how large is that universe going to be. For small molecules, it's easy to kill um, oral bioavailability, and so obviously for these peptides, it's going to be easy to kill it also. So we have to learn how to preserve it effectively. So I just want to leave you with the thought that I began with that um, I believe we will see a revolution in tar targeting science. I've shown you just uh, you know, one, one example of a new type of molecule, and um, we'll, we'll see how it, it pans out as we go forward with it. And uh, Fog Pharma is going to be taking this uh, challenge forward. I'd like to thank my coworkers, most of whom I mentioned, collaborators along the way, and to um, thank you all for your kind uh, attention. Thank you.